As we begin the season of Advent, and I share with you this morning a, a sermon entitled, Live the Story, Tell the Story, I have to tell you that I have never in 29 years of ministry, to my recollection, heard an Advent sermon preached on Luke 1, 1 through 4. And when I read the text, maybe you'll understand why. But there's a purpose and a reason for using this text this morning. And I'm really excited to share with you what God has placed in my heart and mind. Luke 1, 1 through 4, New Living Translation. Luke is writing and speaks. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use the eyewitness report circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I have also decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Luke is discipling, he's mentoring Theophilus. I, I like that name because it's an unusual name, and my name's plain as dirt, Ricky Smith. You just can't get any more plainer than that. So when I hear an unusual name, maybe one you don't hear every day of the week, it, it always grabs my attention. My wife's name's Nona, and when she first told me what her name was and is, I laughed. Really, I, I laughed, and I don't think she was insulted, but anyway... 34 years later, we're still married, right? Happily married, I might add. So names always just seem to grab my attention. Theophilus means friend of God or loved by God. The only redeeming thing about the name Ricky is it means king or mighty ruler. I hadn't got there yet, but I'm looking forward to the day. In order to further Theophilus' knowledge and understanding of the faith, Luke writes what he calls an accurate account of the life of the ministry of Christ. From Jesus' birth there in Bethlehem, through Jesus' young life, even as a 12-year-old boy going back to Jerusalem, through Jesus' ministry as a young adult, his death, his resurrection, and finally in Luke 24, his ascension. Luke gives us a wonderful account of Jesus' life from start to finish, and then even beyond, because he also wrote the Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Holy Spirit there in the early church. Now, scholars believe that Theophilus was a person of status or rank, since Luke referred to him as most honorable Theophilus. The story of Jesus has been told as the story was lived and experienced by our witnesses. So first the story was lived, then the story was told, and now Luke would take this opportunity to yet tell the story again, and he didn't want to leave anything out. He wanted to give an accurate account of what had taken place. Luke, with great intention, took time to think the story through and articulate the story very well, relying on the eyewitnesses of, witnesses reports of Jesus in his ministry, and then those reports handed down, Luke brings together a complete account. Only God knows how many people have come to faith in Jesus Christ through the gospel of Luke. He does such a wonderful job of presenting the good news of Jesus Christ. And that happened because Luke lived the story and Luke told the story. Now, we don't know, we do know that Luke was not one of the 12 original disciples, but we don't know whether or not maybe he was one of the 70 that Jesus sent out in Luke chapter 10. Or maybe even he was one of the 120 in Acts chapter 2 who were in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came and fell upon all who were gathered there. We do know that Luke traveled with Paul and we see that in Acts chapter 21. We further know that to be the truth because at the end of Colossians chapter 4, Paul speaking to the church says, Luke, the beloved physician, 
greets you. So we know in that moment, Luke was there with Paul as God was doing such a wonderful ministry in and through that person, that apostle named Paul. Think for a moment what we would have missed had Luke not been intentional in taking time and effort and energy in giving this accurate account. We wouldn't have the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth and the birth of John in their old age, who would grow up to be John the Baptist, the one who would make the way prepared for the soon coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. If we hadn't had Luke's gospel, we wouldn't have the story of the angel visiting Mary and telling her about what God was about to do in and through her womb. His Holy Spirit would come upon her and that which was conceived would be the holy child and son of God. If it weren't for Luke, we wouldn't hear the story of the shepherds out in the fields with their flocks at night. The angel of the Lord appearing to them and telling them about the birth of Jesus there in Bethlehem and said, go and see in the city of David a Savior has been born. And they went and saw and there he was. Think of all the things we would not have that do complete the story of Jesus Christ had Luke not done what Luke did. Luke wanted to pour into somebody that he loved, Theophilus, and make sure they knew that they knew that they knew the full story of the salvation that God was bringing through Jesus Christ. He wanted Theophilus to know the story, and he wanted him to know the story well. Church, there are many people out there in our community and in the world who have an incomplete knowledge, or maybe know nothing at all of the good news of Jesus Christ. And they need to know more. They need a knowledge unto salvation, the very hope of Christmas himself. They need us to live the story and tell the story that they might also live the story and tell the story themselves. How important it is that you live the story so that as you live, your life will tell the story. I have in my hand a pocket watch. It belonged to my father's father. We called him Papa Smith. Papa Smith loved to wear overalls. And if you're familiar with overalls, you know in the bib on the front of the overalls is a watch pocket. Tuck this little baby in there and it's safely hidden away. On the end of the chain is a coin. And the coin goes in a little buttonhole to secure the chain to the bib. And if your pocket watch were to fall out of your pocket, it's still safe. You can put it right back in. Now, Papa Smith was the one who taught me how to catfish. And I had a great time with Papa Smith fishing. Now, he liked to get up early in the morning. He wanted to be on the bank of the lake before daylight. And he would stay until after dark. It didn't matter to him if he caught a fish or not. He just enjoyed being on the bank of the lake fishing. He's also the one who taught me how to catch a bass, a largemouth bass. Well, he didn't so much teach me, but he gave me the tools with which to do it. I was talking to him one day while we were catfishing about bass fishing, and he said, let me rig you up a rod and reel with a plastic worm you go out there, throw it out as far as you can, reel it in slow, and if you feel something tug on it, wait a couple of seconds, and then set the hook, and if there is a fish on, reel him in. And you know what? I tried that, and I caught my first largemouth bass at McIntosh Lake just outside of Bowden, Georgia. My granddaddy used to tell me stories about his growing up on Upper Sand Mountain, close to Eider. Maybe you've been to Eider before. Very small town, small community up in the northeastern part of the state. He would tell me about a dog he had named Ring. It was a feist, colored in such a way that he had a ring around his, his neck. And Ring 
love to catch snakes. And Ring would be out in the land around the house, and when he found a snake, he would start barking. And when my grandpa would hear the dog barking in such a way, he knew Ring had found another snake. So off grandpa would go to the sound of the dog. And when he's about 30, 40 feet away, the dog would position himself such that the snake was between the dog and Papa Smith. And when Papa got closer to the snake and the snake would pick up on Papa's presence, the snake would turn its head to see what was coming up behind it. Bam! The dog got the snake. He also loved to take Ring hunting. And he would sit out in the woods with Ring and he would watch the dog instead of the treetops. Ring would sit there and look in the treetops for the squirrels and my papa would look at Ring and once Ring stopped and focused, he knew that's where the squirrel was. And that day he would take a squirrel home for supper. I enjoyed the stories that my grandpa often shared with me. Today, I hold in my hand his pocket watch. It still runs if you wind it, but it has no eternal significance in my life. I can hold it in my hand, but I can't hold it in my heart. Not one time did I ever hear Papa Smith mention the name of Jesus. Not one time did he ever tell me, about his faith. Not one time am I aware that Papa Smith ever went to church except the day his casket lie in the altar of Antioch Baptist Church. Antioch Baptist Church was next door to his house. Paul Paul didn't live the story, so he couldn't tell the story. I don't know whether or not he had any faith in Christ. I hope he did. But if he did, he didn't share it with me. And I hope and pray this morning that your kids and your grandkids and your friends and your co-workers and the people in your community and your workplace don't have to wonder whether or not you have faith in Jesus Christ. I hope that as you go forth from this place that you live the story. And as you get the opportunity to live the story, you also get the opportunity to tell the story to those who have not yet heard the story or have not yet heard the complete version of the story. I can hold that gift in my hand, but I can't hold that gift in my heart. My dad gave me a gift I can hold in my heart. A faith that has been strongly encouraged by the transformation I saw in his life. Now, dad was a good man. I only heard him say a, a few cuss words the whole, whole time of, of my years together with him. Just a few little four-letter words. Maybe if somebody pulled out in front of him in traffic and, and cut him off and endangered the family, he might let just a little one slip. But Dad, by the world standards, was a good man. But I got the honor and the privilege of seeing Dad become a godly man. I remember growing up, Dad only went to worship on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. But after Dad gave his heart and life to Jesus, he was at Sunday school. Sunday morning worship, Sunday evening worship, Wednesday evening Bible study, and he was present for whatever service opportunity he could be a part of during the week. I remember him standing up in the church on Sunday night, giving a testimony, breaking on Jesus a little bit when the pastor gave them the opportunity to do so. He would stand up and say, I love the Lord, and I'm thankful that He forgave my sins. I'm thankful that I'm saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And, and on he would go for a minute or two. Dad was like E.F. Hutton. He didn't talk a whole lot, so if he did, you wanted to pay attention because he had something to say worth hearing. I remember those Sunday afternoon walks through the woods that we took every Sunday begin to be transformed themselves. 
I loved to go through the woods with Dad because he would show me the plants and the trees and the animals. And, and on a good day, a, a lucky day, if you will, we'd go down to the creek and we would look under rocks and try to find crawfish and things like that. And I love to spend that kind of time with my dad. But there came a change in those Sunday afternoon walks after he gave his heart to Jesus. We would be walking down the, the, the beaten path and, and dad would stop and he would turn and look at me with a quiver on his chin and he'd say, son, the Lord's calling on me to pray. And I need to just step off the beaten path and pray. Would you like to pray with me? And I said, yes, sir, I would. So we would go off the path and kneel down there in the edge of the woods and I would hear my daddy pray because the Lord had called on him to pray. I remember Sunday nights when worship, were over, worship was over and we were back home that he would gather the family around the couch in the living room and we would have prayer. I mean, once Jesus was in his heart and in his life, the couch became the altar of our home. Now I know that it's more important to leave something in someone's heart than to leave something in someone's hand. My dad lived the story, and I got to see it take place with my very own eyes. Now, due to the impact he had on my life, I get to live the story and tell the story with people just like you. And can I tell you this morning, there's people in the community and the world that need you to tell the story and to live the story in front of them each and every day. When I was at Pleasant Hill in Florence, I had the opportunity to meet a lady who was in the hospital. Her name was Melanie McIntosh. She had been in the hospital for several weeks and she already had coated blue two or three times, which means she died and they shocked her and they brought her back and she was not doing very well, even at the ripe old age of 40. I was invited to go see Melanie and I did and I, I, I followed that up with other visits and as I visited with her in the hospital, I invited the church members to go and to visit with her as well. And since Melanie had had no visitors... She was so glad to have the church come and visit with her. And as we just shared life and love with her, one day she told me, Pastor Ricky, I want to be like you people one day. I've looked for you people all my life. And I have to tell you, she had lived a rough, rough life that didn't resemble anything that looked godly. So it doesn't matter how you evaluate somebody's life in the world. It doesn't mean they're not hungry for Jesus. I mean, she could cuss with the best of them. I mean, she would make me blush at how she talked sometimes. But deep down inside, she said, I have looked for you people all my life. One day, I want to be like you. One day, I want to sing in the choir at the church in a granny dress. I don't even know if they make granny dresses anymore. You know those dresses that come all the way down to the floor? Well, there came a day that she gave her heart and life to Jesus. And that beautiful transformation of life took place because people were willing to live the story and tell the story with intention. What Luke did, he did on purpose. He did with intention. He did carefully and he did wonderfully. Why? Because he was pouring the good news of Jesus Christ into a soul that mattered to him and mattered to God. And because people chose to pour into, to live the story, to tell the story to a lady named Melanie, she now gets to sing in the choir in heaven since she never got to sing in the choir on earth. Church, we need to live the story in front of others until we have the privilege of then telling them the story. 
Because if you live it long enough, sooner or later they're going to ask you about it. There are people out there who want to know the story. Now, let me tell you, Hallmark is producing multitudes of wonderful, warm and fuzzy Christmas stories. The problem is they're leaving out the Christ in the story. I watch them, I know. I love, I love a good happy ending movie. But they're leaving the Christ out of the story. But it's not their job, it's our job. It's the church's job to tell the story of Jesus. First, by leaving it. And by leaving it, then you get the opportunity to tell it. People need to hear and know the hope of Christmas. His name is Jesus Christ. It's up to the church to keep Christ in Christmas, and we do that by living the story and telling the story each day of our lives. We again have the opportunity to share gifts this Christmas. We can share a gift that can be held in someone's hand and never have any Eternal significance. Awaken, give gifts that will change hearts and lives for eternity. Church, live the story. And as you live the story, take every opportunity that arises to tell the story that others may come to faith in Christ. It is the reason for the season. Amen? Amen? Amen. We have a hymn of invitation. I love to tell the story. I love to sing this song. If you have anything on your heart and mind that you'd like to pray about this morning, this altar is open. If I can pray with you about those things, please get my attention. I would love to do that. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you would want and desire to receive Him as your Lord and Savior this morning, we invite you to come. I would love to pray that prayer with you. Let us stand and sing our praises to the Lord.